Hello, my name is Joanna Bernaka, and I am a professor of biostatistics and psychiatry at the Mayo Clinic, where I direct the psychiatric genomics and pharmacogenomics research program. And it is my pleasure to open the session on psychiatric pharmacogenomics. As part of this session, we will highlight the work of two consortia. The PGC antidepressant response study with Professor Do uh, Catherine Lewis providing an introduction and Dr. Oliver Payne giving an update on recent and ongoing analyses. Then Professor Thomas Schultzer will introduce the consortium in lithium genetics and Dr. Brandon Coombs will highlight some recent polygenic risk score analyses. Finally, I will return at the end to summarize a couple of recent smaller psychiatric pharmacogenomic studies with an emphasis on future research directions. I also want to bring to your attention um, a live panel discussion that we will be having at the WC the CPG PGC day, also on the topic of psychiatric pharmacogenomics, this time with a focus on the challenges and opportunities, particularly with respect to consortia on the topic of psychiatric pharmacogenomics. I will begin with a very brief introduction to set the stage for our series of talks. So pharmacogenomics can be defined as the study of inter-individual genetic variation that is correlated with pharmacological function and therefore therapeutic response. And the rationale for pharmacogenomics research is that response to most medications varies considerably between patients and genetic differences between people contribute to drug response by influencing both pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic mechanisms that ultimately contribute to clinical response. So broadly speaking, we can think about two key goals of pharmacogenomics research. The first is precision medicine, or the idea of using genomic along with non-genomic information to predict treatment outcomes and therefore guide treatment selection. So first, we need to identify the predictors, predictors of treatment outcomes, and then use those predictors to calculate the probability of a favorable response. And finally, use those probabilities to help us select the best medication and dosage for each patient. And in pharmacogenomics in particular, we are interested in the genetic predictors of treatment response. The second broad goal is to learn about drug mechanisms of action. The knowledge of the genetic predictors of treatment response provides information on both the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics involved in drug response. This information can then be used to guide drug repurposing, improvement, and development of novel therapeutics. So the current approach in psychiatric pharmacogenomics research needs to primarily focus on discovery of the relevant genetic variation and uncovering the genetic architecture of treatment outcomes. This can be achieved through large sample GWAS and similar analyses such as sequencing, as well as post GWAS analyses. So here we're talking about the methods that have been used so successfully to study that psychiatric disease risk by the PGC. And I emphasize this because often when we talk about psychiatric pharmacogenomics research, there seems to be an immediate desire to skip ahead to clinical implementation, for instance, trials of genetic, genetically guided treatment selection. And then the question arises, but are the predictors good enough at this point? And for the most part, no, they're not. Uh, and that is precisely why at this stage, in, in research in pharmacogenomics, we still need the sort of genetic discovery approach like we get with GWAS, and we need to apply that to pharmacogenomics the way we have done to disease risk. So today's session will focus on this type of research. So now I'll turn it over to Professor Catherine Lewis and her presentation on the PGC antidepressant study. Hello, I'm Catherine Lewis. I'm Professor of Statistical Genetics at King's College London, and I also co-chair the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium Major Depressive Disorder Working Group, along with Andrew McIntosh. And today I'm going to give you an introduction to the PGC MDD's group's work on uh, detecting the genetic component to antidepressant response. First, my conflict of interest. I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Board at Myriad Neuroscience. So 
Why would we want to detect the genetic component to the response to antidepressants? Well, treatment, to, treatment for depression is well established. People can undergo psychological therapy or uh, pharmacological therapy in the form of antidepressants. And we have 20 to 30 antidepressants that are widely prescribed. But sadly, many of those are not very effective for many of the patients that take them. In fact, only about a third of MDD patients will respond to the first antidepressant that is prescribed, and approximately a third will go on to develop treatment-resistant depression. And you can see how that works in this slide currently shared by the Australian Genetics of Depression study, uh, where uh, participants in their study have self-reported how well antidepressants worked for them. You can see the antidepressants across the x-axis and that pink bar that lies between 30 and 40 percent for each antidepressant is telling you that for a substantial minority of patients, this antidepressant did not work very well. And so our key question here is whether genetics can help us predict better who will respond to which antidepressant. So this is the current pipeline of, um, of therapy for um, depression, where people try a sequence of antidepressants um, in, in order to find at least one um, that is effective um, in alleviating their symptoms. And perhaps one day we will be able to have a genetic test that will help guide choice between those antidepressants and perhaps also um, help people um, guide the choice between pharmacological and psychological therapy. And the aim of that is that we would like to increase that 30% of patients that, you, that respond to the first antidepressant to perhaps 40 or 50%. Uh, and given depression is so common, this could have a substantial impact on therapeutic options. And so perhaps we could look forward to a day when our genetics forms part of our uh, medical record and a dashboard for a primary care provider or a psychiatrist would look like this. And in uh, prescribing antidepressants, they would get an indication for each antidepressant of the likely efficacy and side effects um, to give them valuable information to balance with their professional judgment of what the appropriate treatment could be. There's a lot of interest in this type of uh, pharmacogenetic um, um, therapy for depression. Um, uh, two common articles here, both in, in the popular press um, and uh, in the scientific literature, show you that, um, that this is uh, an idea that many people are considering. But sadly, we are very far behind in the evidence needed um, to introduce such a test. We've um, been performing genome-wide association studies on um, uh, antidepressant response for about the last 10 years, but most of those have been very disappointing in their results with few genome-wide significant findings identified, and those that are identified often not replicated across studies. This slide just gives you a picture of some of those studies, and you can see that the sample size, although substantial, um, given the amount of effort needed to collect these types of studies, the sample sizes in thousands of um, patients, study participants, um, is much lower than the tens or the hundreds of thousands that we standardly use in identifying the genetic component for susceptibility to a disorder. One of the reasons uh, why these studies have been so challenging is the noise in the outcome measure. So this slide here gives uh, the trajectory of response uh, for the first few participants in our GenDEP study. Along the x-axis, you can see the weeks of treatment um, with zero being the baseline measure when the, the patient entered the trial. And on the y-axis is the Madras scale that measures the level of depression symptoms. Um, and you can see for most patients, as you would hope, that their line reduces through um, the, the, the period uh, of treatment here. But for some patients, as in the uh, green line highlighted here, um, their depression score was worse at the end of treatment um, than it was at the beginning. 
And this gives us two possible outcomes uh, to use. We can use a continuous measure of percentage change from the baseline measure, or we can use a uh, discrete uh, measure of overall outcome of the treatment. For example, did the patient reach uh, remission? But whatever outcome measure we choose, you can see that this data collected, it has a substantial amount of noise in it. So where are we currently in the studies of uh, depression treatment response? So we do know several things. We know that there are no big hits. There are no single genetic variants that carry a, a major source of signal as to whether someone will respond to an antidepressant or not. We have currently no replicated uh, findings from our genome-wide association studies, um, and as yet no uh, confirmed polygenic predictors. It's also clear that the candidate genes that we we might be interested in are not um, coming out strongly in these studies. But we do have confirmed heritability, uh, approximately 42%, one study estimated. We are being successful in increasing our sample sizes and in also in making sure that the studies that are recruited to these studies come from worldwide and not just from Western developed nations. So what do we need? We need substantially more work on uh, both pharmacological and psychological uh, response to treatment. Um, we need the sort of widespread data sharing that the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium has been known for. It's clear that no single study can make much headway in this area. We need to collaborate to achieve the large sample sizes required. We need work on harmonizing our response data, which may be across different measures of treatment. And we also need some creative approaches that might help us expand our sample sizes further, for example, um, extracting relevant information from electronic health records or using treatment resistant depression. So the aim of uh, this antidepressant response study from the PGC is that through collaboration with researchers worldwide, we'd be able to attain sufficiently large sample sizes um, of patients treated with antidepressants to perform well-powered genome-wide association studies that will enable us to identify the genetic variants associated with the response to these drugs. And we will achieve that through collaboration with clinicians, geneticists, analysts, all the multidisciplinary teams that are involved in these studies through data sharing um, and uh, performing this GWAS analysis and also identifying both the specific genetic variants that are associated, but also using approaches like polygenic risk scores to identify the genetic correlates of treatment response. If you would like to collaborate with us and join the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium MDD group, do get in touch with um, myself or Andrew. You can find out more about the PGC on this website here. And I'm now going to hand over to my postdoc, Dr. Oliver Payne, who will tell you about the exciting progress that we are currently making through the PGC. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Oliver Payne, and as Catherine said, I'm going to be presenting work that's been carried out by the Antidepressant Response Group so far, and I'll finish with some future directions. So this table shows a list of the cohorts that are currently within the Antidepressant Response Group, and uh, there's a range of uh, cohorts, all consisting of individuals diagnosed with major depressive disorder, and have been assessed for depressive symptoms at baseline bef before taking an antidepressant and after taking an antidepressant. The analyses that I'm going to present today are based on a subset of the cohorts, and these are those with uh, European ancestry and individual level data available, as these were the cohorts that allowed us to carry out these uh, analyses. And in this subset, we have over 5,300 individuals. There are some differences between the cohorts. Uh, for example, the antidepressants they were prescribed and also the symptom scale used to assess depress depressive symptoms. We defined antidepressant response using the two measures Catherine mentioned bef before. Uh, these are remission, the binary outcome and percentage improvement. 
the continuous outcome. This slide shows a brief overview of the genetic data preparation analysis. So the quality control, imputation, and association analysis was all performed within the Rickapilly pipeline, the PGC's pipeline for uh, these um, analyses. And we also performed uh, several downstream analyses. Um, I've highlighted the top three, as these are those I'm gonna present today. And they are to estimate the SNP-based heritability, estimate evidence for genetic overlap between antidepressant response and related outcomes, and also see whether we can predict antidepressant response out of sample using our GWAS summer statistics. So this slide shows the Manhattan plots for the two GWAS, and you can see there are no genome-wide significant associations. This isn't hugely surprising as the sample size is still modest, but there was no evidence of inflation in the QQ plots, uh, which indicates we're controlling the population structure uh, sufficiently. So we went on to estimate the SNP-based heritability. We did this using two methods, Gremel based on individual level data and LD score regression uh, based on GWAS summary statistics. The results are broadly concordant between the two methods as they both indicate that remission has a statistically significant SNP-based heritability, whereas percentage improvement does not. And this is really interesting because the uh, phenotypic correlation between these measures is quite high, but it suggests that they are capturing something slightly different and we will have to look into this in the future. Something else we wanted to explore was to what extent is the heterogeneity between the cohorts driving down the SNP-based heritability? And we did this by uh, further estimating the SNP-based heritability using an approach called Meta-Gremel. And this approach estimates the SNP-based heritability within each cohort separately, and then we meta-analyze those within sample estimates. And this gives us an idea of what the SNP-based heritability would be within a homogeneous context. And we can see that for both the measures, uh, there's an increase in SNP-based heritability with both now showing statistically significant uh, heritability. But interestingly, the, uh, the greater SNP-based heritability of remission still remains, uh, suggesting that um, this difference between the measures is not being driven by uh, differences in between sample heterogeneity. So next we looked for genetic overlap uh, with the eight outcomes listed here. This was done using polygenic risk scoring and subsequent Avenge-me analysis to estimate genetic covariance. And what we found was that there was a significant evidence that a genetic liability for schizophrenia was associated with poorer response to antidepressants. And an, uh, an increased genetic propensity to educational attainment was associated with improved antidepressant response. And both these findings are interesting and, and they, they're also concordant with previous literature um, indicating that both a risk of psychosis associated with poor response and also an, uh, an increased socioeconomic status is associated with improved response. We also found uh, that there was a significant association between liability for autism spectrum disorder and antidepressant response, which uh, is novel and must be replicated. But it was interesting because the converse finding was found for CBT response suggesting that if both these findings are replicated, this could be used as a uh, clinical decision-making tool. So lastly, we tested whether or not we could predict out of sample using our GWAS summary statistics. We did this using a leave one out procedure to avoid overfitting and found for both measures that multiple p-value thresholds were able to provide uh, statistically significant 
variance explained out of sample. Now, the uh, variance explained is very low. It's about 0.1% for both measures, but this is really encouraging uh, as it's the first time an antidepressant response GWAS has been able to predict out of sample and suggests that as we further increase sample size, uh, we, this signal will only become stronger. So in conclusion, we've shown that antidepressant response has a significant SNP-based heritability. A genetic liability to psychosis was associated with poorer response and a genetic propensity to education was associated with improved response. And lastly, we show significant uh, out of sample prediction using our GWAS results, suggesting that uh, we are moving in the right direction and we just need to further increase sample size. Of course, there are um, a few limitations here and the, the group is keen to address these in the future. Uh, one still remains, sample size is still fairly modest and we can integrate further clinically defined prospective studies as we have already um, to improve power. Another approach is to uh, look at what electronic health record derived measures of antidepressant response can provide. For example, treatment resistant depression can be derived using prescription records. And lastly, very importantly, as we have a larger sample size going forward, we hope to be able to stratify our samples into uh, groups treated with specific drugs or look at changes in specific depressive symptoms. And this is with the uh, hope of highlighting genetic effects within these more homogeneous groups. Uh, lastly, I have to thank everyone that's been involved in this work and the group, um, the leadership by Catherine Lewis and Andrew McIntosh, and also the analysts and PIs for all of the contributing data sets uh, for whom, which this work would not have been possible. Next, we're going to be hearing from Thomas Schultz about their exciting work within the Condogen Consortium regarding the genetics of lithium response. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to present to you the work of the Consortium on Lithium Genetics and to give you an overview of its history, its mission, and to give you a brief outlook on where we want to go in the next couple of years. Conagen, the Consortium on Lithium Genetics, was started, was founded in 2008 by a group of researchers who actually met in person, that was still possible back then in 2008 at the NIMH, researchers that were and are still interested in bipolar disorder, especially bipolar disorder being treated with lithium and genetics. So they said that we need to do something about lithium genetics. That is, we need to understand more about the mechanism of action of a drug that has been used for 70 years and is still a mainstay in mood stabilization all over the world. Unfortunately, numbers, prescription numbers are going down, but we think that by studying the biology, we can learn more about it and we also be in a better position to promote this amazing drug. So there are many missions here and, um, but of course, for that, talk now, let's focus on the genetics. So these researchers came from all over the world and they uh, put together a first sample, a first sample of roughly 2,500 people, people suffering from bipolar disorder, being treated with lithium for whom genetic data was available. But before we did the GWAS, actually we tried to come up and we I think came up with a phenotype definition that works. You have to consider the whole world. You have to consider various fashions of how lithium is prescribed, how lithium is given, how lithium is perceived. And so in such a global endeavor, it's not that easy to come up with a good measure of lithium response. But we did because we have great people on board and we use a scale developed by Martin Alda and Paul Groff, the lithium response scale, also known as the Alda scale. And we have come up with a ve very fine-tuned guideline as to how to 
it's a listen response. And we come up with continuous and a dichotomous measure that was applied or is being applied to all individuals included in our studies. And our first study was the GWAS in roughly 2,500 individuals. We actually found loci, genome-wide significant loci, which was sort of surprising because the sample size was not that large. And we all know that you need large sample sizes, but this may be telling us that lithium response is quite a homogeneous phenotype that lends itself to genome-wide studies. What we found were not some intuitive results. We found actually non-coding RNA markers. Well, I think we have to leave it at there because it's no use interpreting or putting too much interpretation into these findings. But I think we have a case in point that lithium genetics can work, a GWAS on lithium response can work, and we need to move ahead and to use whatever resources we have available to make this a continuous journey leading to larger samples so as to, in the end, understand more about the biology of lithium response. We published this in 2016 in The Lancet, and I'm really happy to show that everybody who was part of that, who was part of that, is also part of the list of authors. We, we are a very inclusive consortium, and we want to keep it that way. And we travel the world to teach everyone about us. We teach everyone about our phenotype definition in very far-flung places, as you may see. And what is really great is these are not necessarily genetic researchers. These are clinicians who are dedicated, who are dedicated to their patients, and who are dedicated to understanding what the drugs they give to people do in people's bodies. And that's what we want to do. That's what we want to find out. So we have new sites that will be joining us. These are the yellow dots all over the world. You can find them on our list on our website, www.pondogen.org. And we are happy to become part of our family. And with you then, we could do all these things that we want to do. We, ex we could extend our current sample size, 5,000 samples, we can focus more in low and middle income countries in the so-called developing world where lithium is widely in use. And there we can do things we cannot do in the traditional European, American, or Australian settings. We can look at more broader pictures and more genetic diversity. We hope to grow the phenotype database, adding more psychopathological information, information on side effects, we would like to explore in depth the phenotypic measures we use. We hope to identify new loci that are relevant to lithium response. We hope to ascertain population specific effects. We hope to generate lithium response polygenic scores that may improve predictive models. And by the way, you can already now be part of this endeavor by requesting data, by requesting summary statistics, and that is being used. Many studies have already used our data, our phenotype data, our genomic data, our summary stats. And so please do join us. Please do join this great family of great folks, which is the Consortium on Lithium Genetics. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Brandon Coombs, and I'll be talking about ongoing efforts in Conley Gen. And I'll be talking about how we use polygenic risk scores to predict treatment response to lithium. If you're interested in see more details, you can watch the, my oral session during the Bipolar Affective Disorder Depression session at, on Tuesday, October 20th at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So first, Conley Gen is made up of 23 different sites across 15 different countries, and there's 2,500 patients, 2,500 plus patients so far that have been collected that have been treated with lithium. And this represents the currently the largest GWAS of lithium response. And in that GWAS, only one significant locus was found. One particular challenge that always comes up with pharmacogenomics is how do we measure treatment response? This is particularly challenging with bipolar disorder because of the course of the illness. And so the ALDA score was developed to retrospectively quantify the clinical improvement in bipolar disorder. 
So this, this, all the score is made up of two components. First, the A score, which measures the, the clinical improvement in frequency, duration, and severity of illness. And then the B score is anything that subtracts away from your A score. So A score, the higher that you have, the better that you ever responded. And B score is subtracting away from that A score. So particular confounding factors might be that you are on multiple medications or you weren't on a medication long enough. And that's what the B score is considered. This all the score was determined to have a high inter-rate of reliability within Conley Gen. And Conley Gen actually trains all of the different investigators on how to do all the scoring. And when we go to analyze this outcome, the, we, we use either a quantitative outcome, so you could use A minus B, so a total all the score, or maybe an A score alone, which then you would want to adjust for a B score. And you could also use a dichotomous outcome, so the all the score uh, greater than six. So here it's highlighted on the left is the all the score across all the different sites that are currently uh, uh, included in Conley Gen. And those uh, at the top are considered responders to lithium. And as I mentioned before, there were oh, there was only one genome-wide significant variant, and it turns out that's because lithium response is a complex genetic trait and will likely need many more samples uh, to be included in GWAS before we have the power to detect any uh, uh, genome-wide significant variant. But we can detect polygenic effects at this stage, and that's done using polygenic risk scores. And it's been used in the past. Here in, the, in 2018, it was shown that higher genetic risk for schizophrenia was associated with poor response to lithium in Conley Gen. And then the 2020 follow-up was showing that genetic risk for depression is associated with poor response to lithium. So what I'm adding in here today is that there's also literature that shows that history of ADHD can predict poor response to lithium. And so what I wanted to do is, using what we've learned in the past from polygenic risk scores, also incorporate an ADHD polygenic risk score and, and determine whether certain genetic profiles respond worse to lithium. So to do this, I use the two different outcomes, quantitative or dichotomous. I use lasso sum to create PRSs for ADHD, uh, MDD, and bipolar disorder. And how we do that is using what we've learned about those different uh, disorders. And we can look at the Manhattan plot here and apply what we've learned to the Conley Gen samples, which will then create our PRS. And I use lasso sum to do this. And finally, um, Conley Gen is particularly challenging uh, with how many different sites there are and the fact that there's so many different small sites and small uh, sample sizes within each of those and different genotyping chips that were used, it can be quite tricky to how you actually analyze this. So we, we meta-analyze in four different groups. There's two different European groups. Then we have a Japanese and tai uh, Taiwanese sample. And uh, we adjust for PCs in the, in the analysis and which genotyping chip you are in. And I also use uh, different models to adjust for the fact that there's different error among different sites. So going to the results, I first looked at these four PRSs uh, individually to see if they were each individually associated with uh, lithium response. And so when we look at this PRS association, I have the negative log 10 p-value on the side. And so if something is predicting better response, it'll be going up that's predicting worse responsibly going down. And the first thing we can see is the previous findings. So first that schizophrenia risk predicts, uh, uh, higher schizophrenia risk predicts worse response and higher depression risk predicts worse response. And what we can see here is it turns out ADHD risk, the higher ADHD risk you have, it also predicts worse response. So the next thing I did is included all of these in one model. And that way we can see what's the association of each of these PRSs after adjusting for other associations from the other PRSs. And what we can see is the schizophrenia PRS is no longer significant after adjusting for ADHD and MDD PRS. And therefore, what we see is higher genetic risk for ADHD and MDD are associated with worse response to lithium even after adjusting for one another. A uh, whole caveat to all of these PR, PRS analyses is that none of these PRSs explain a huge proportion of the variation in lithium response. 
And so right now they can't be used clinically, but we can still use them to learn what's driving different responses in, uh, to lithium. And this sort of strategy can be used beyond lithium and beyond Conley Gen, and we can use this to, to look at polygenic risk prediction of response to other medications. And that's actually what the next speaker will be talking about. Joanna Bernacca will be talking about moving beyond uh, the, the previous two consortiums and looking at a broader range of uh, medications and how we treat psychiatric disorders. Thanks. Hello again. I hope you've enjoyed the talks on the consortium efforts in psychiatric pharmacogenomics. And now I will talk about some smaller new initiatives in psychiatric pharmacogenomics that we are hoping to expand into bigger collaborations. So I have no conflicts to declare. So you've already uh, heard in this session about large collaborative GWAS of psychiatric treatment response, including antidepressant treatment studies in MDD and lithium treatment studies in bipolar disorder. And there are other areas of psychiatric treatments that have been studied using this approach, including antipsychotic treatment outcomes in schizophrenia. But what about other treatments such as non-lithium mood stabilizer treatment of bipolar disorder or pharmacological treatment of alcohol use disorders? Much less progress has been made in those areas. And these are the ones that I want to talk about today. So I'll start by discussing some pharmacogenomic studies in bipolar disorder treatment outcomes. So bipolar disorder is often treated with lithium, and you've already heard about the efforts in lithium pharmacogenomics led by the Consortium on Lithium Genetics. But bipolar disorder is also treated with many other medications, including other types of mood stabilizers. These include certain anticonvulsants or anti-epileptic drugs, such as valproate and lamotrigine. Bipolar disorder is also treated with antidepressants, antipsychotics, and a number of other medications. For today's presentation, I will talk about studies involving anticonvulsants or antiepileptic mood stabilizer drugs. So we recently published the first genome-wide association study of antiepileptic mood stabilizer drug response in bipolar disorder. This was a very small study with only 199 participants, most of whom took either valproate or lamotrigine or both, and some took a number of other medications. The treatment outcome that we used in our study is the ALDA score, which you already heard about in the, the talks about lithium response. And we use the total ALDA score, which is the A score minus the B score, and the distribution of that score is, in our sample is plotted here. So we first ran a standard genome association study at the SNP level. And despite the very small sample, we had two genome-wide significant findings. Now, in such a small sample, you might be a little bit skeptical about uh, these genome-wide significant findings, but both of them were in, in very uh, interesting genes. So for instance, our top finding with a p-value of seven times 10 to negative nine was this gene called THSD7A. And this gene was recently identified as a bipolar disorder risk locus. So in fact, it came up as genome-wide significant in a recent PGC GWAS of bipolar disorder published just last year. We then performed a gene level analysis uh, at the genome-wide level as well. And we found two genome-wide significant findings here. The top one is ABCC1. And both of these are quite interesting, but this one especially I want to focus on. So with a p-value of 6.7 times 10 to negative seven, um, ABCC1 is also known as MRP1, multi-drug resistance associated protein. And this gene encodes a drug transporter protein. So immediately this was interesting. These drug transporters are believed to be involved in transport of anti-epileptic drugs. So we ran some additional analyses, and here we have, uh, applied the approach uh, in the predict scan software, which is uh, equivalent to, to a TWAS type approach, except we focused on specific genes that we already identified through the gene level analysis. So we predicted the gene expression level of each patient from, from the SNP data, and then we looked at correlation of that predicted expression with the other score which is representative of the treatment outcome. And the result that we had was really quite interesting because it was consistent 
with the drug resistance hypothesis of anti-epileptic drugs. So this hypothesis states that these drugs, uh, pharmacoresistance to these drugs may be due to enhanced removal of the drugs from the relevant tissue at the blood-brain barrier through overexpression of the ABC transporters. And this is essentially what we see here is that higher expression of the transporter leads to worse treatment outcomes. So this is very interesting. I'm not going to go over all of the details of, of our analyses because the paper is published and I would encourage you to take a look at it if you're, if you're interested. But what I want to point out is that in this very small sample analysis, we have very promising results. It's possible that some of them are driven by winner's curse, but it's also possible that there may be some genes with large effects. So what we can conclude here is that we do need uh, GWASs in larger samples, but this study provides strong motivation for further analyses of pharmacogenomics of anticonvulsant mood stabilizers. So now I will turn to my other example, which is pharmacogenomics in alcohol use disorder treatment outcomes. So there are currently three FDA approved medications for alcohol use disorders, including naltrexone, which helps prevent excessive consumption, and a campersate, which supports abstinence. And these two more recently developed medications are the focus of much research right now as they are being used increasingly in the clinic. Yet there are still no published genome-wide association studies of response to these medications. There are a few small candidate gene studies, but no GWAS. So we recently performed the first known, uh, known to us GWASs of uh, medication response in alcohol use disorders. We focus on two treatment outcomes within three months of initiating medication. We looked at time until relapse to any drinking, as well as time until relapse to heavy drinking, with heavy drinking defined as per NIAAA. We used data from three studies, and we analyzed the, the data from the three studies separately, followed by meta-analysis. In each of the studies, we performed survival analyses of time until relapse and time until heavy relapse. The three studies uh, from which we obtained data were a combined PREDICT and the Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Treatment of Addiction, or CEDA study. Combine was a US-based study. It was a placebo-controlled study of a campersate and naltrexone and their combination. PREDICT was a German study designed to mimic Combine in some ways, and it was also placebo-controlled, and it was a study of a campersate and naltrexone. The Mayo Clinic CEDA study was uh, only a study of a campersate. And the sample sizes that we had for each of the studies after quality control and subsetting to patients with available clinical response data are shown here. So like I said, we first performed an analysis of time until relapse and then time until heavy relapse. And here are the Manhattan plots for, for the analysis of all the patients together so that it's including both a campersate and naltrexone as well as placebo treated patients. We see that in the time until relapse analysis, there were no genome-wide significant findings. The top gene here is KCNQ4, which is a potassium voltage-gated channel member um, and possibly an interesting candidate, but not genome-wide significant. In the time until heavy relapse analysis, there was a genome-wide significant peak, which maps to the gene BRE, which goes by a number of other aliases. And this is uh, the brain and reproductive organ expressed gene. So certainly worthy of further follow-up given its genome-wide significance here. We also performed the one out polygenic risk score analyses in this data. Again, the full data set of just over a thousand patients. And for both time until relapse and time until heavy relapse, we saw significant evidence of association between AUD treatment outcomes and the corresponding polygenic risk score. We then ran um, analyses in drug stratified samples so for both a campersate and naltrexone. And here I'm focusing on the naltrexone results. And this was a very small sample of only 300 patients. We see that in time until relapse, there's a couple of peaks, but nothing genome-wide significant. In time until heavy relapse, there is one genome-wide significant SNP. But where I want to draw your attention to is actually not the genome-wide significant hit, 
But this association here, it's the same top SNP here on chromosome 9, that is almost genome-wide significant in both time until relapse and time until heavy relapse. And it is intronic to PTPRD, and this is a very interesting gene. It has been implicated in multiple addiction-related phenotypes in humans and in animal studies. And there is a very nice review recently published about this gene and discussing not only its involvement in addiction phenotypes, but also its role as a potential drug target or treatment target in addiction. So this study of, of AUD treatment outcome pharmacogenomics is currently under review. But what I want to point out is that we had the first evidence here of polygenic contribution to AUD treatment outcomes. We've also identified several genome-wide significant associations that need replication in larger samples. And despite not being quite genome-wide significant, I think the PTPRD finding is very interesting and also warrants further follow-up. And here I want to echo the same conclusions that I had um, in discussing the anti-epileptic mood stabilizer response pharmacogenomic study, is that GWASs in larger samples are needed, such as the ones we heard about from Catherine Lewis and Thomas Schultzen. So this study, again, provides strong motivation for further research into pharmacogenomics of AUD treatment outcomes, and I hope larger collaborative efforts will follow our findings here. So I'd like to thank my colleagues and collaborators on both of these studies, the anticonvulsant study, as well as the, as, as the AUD pharmacogenomics study, including our external collaborators from Combine, PREDICT, and NIAAA, and I'd like to acknowledge the funding. So I'd also like to encourage you to please reach out to me if you'd like to collaborate in either anticonvulsant mood stabilizer pharmacogenomics research or in AUD treatment outcomes pharmacogenomics. So please email me if you'd like to collaborate. And finally, I'd like to remind you to please join us for the live panel discussion on the challenges and opportunities um, for psychiatric pharmacogenomics consortia. And thank you and hope to see you there.